Hi, can you all hear me? Amul, your mic yes, is... Dr. Priyanka, hi. Uh, tell me, I think we can wait for a minute and then start. Uh, no. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Good evening, Dr. Ruf Hello. Yeah. Hello. Good, evening. Hello. Can you, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, Dr. Rufino. We can hear you. Okay. Yeah. So we are ready. Uh, we are, we'll just wait for a minute or so for some okay. people to join in and then we can start. Okay, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Priyanka, are you there? Yeah. Um, Dr. Priyanka, should we start? Yes, yes, it's seven o'clock. I think we'll start. Uh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Dr. Vikram, are you are you there? Vikram has joined. Yes, Babita, yes, thank you. Um I'll I won't switch on the video yet. I think you're going to okay. do the so, no, sure. things. Uh, Unless you want me to switch on the video, I'm happy to. No, no, no. no. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, a very uh, warm welcome to to everybody who has joined the uh, the program. 
a very warm welcome to dr rufino and dr amol tilwe the president of goa state ima the uh, secretary goa state ima thanks for being over here and in your esteemed presence i think today we would like to go on with the installation of uh, our team ima margaon team um, before that let me before i start uh, our thing i think i would be failing in my duty if we do not pay our humble tribute and our condolences to uh, dr nag uh, nagvekar's family who whom we lost a very uh, the founder one of the founder members of ima margaon and one of the stalwarts of uh, ima margaon he died with a with a stroke uh, last i think a week back almost 10 days back so uh, our uh, from all the members of the ima on behalf of ima uh, we pay our condolences to the members of the family and uh, we stand in their uh, grief uh, and before we carry forward with the program i request dr priyanka uh, kamath uh, dhakankar to kindly uh, say our ima prayer and we rise for the prayer may happiness come to all we pray to you that everyone of us ensure that no one suffers from pain or sorrow neither do i desire the crown nor heaven nor rebirth i only desire the suffering of creatures only to suffer a pain or sorrow thank you dr priyanka uh, i kindly request uh, uh, the one who is not talking i need please request to put their uh, audio off audio mute uh, last year i think we have uh, just a few words from me last year we have seen a fraternity going through some of the worst nightmares of our profession and it has taken a toll on many despite the fact that we had limited knowledge of the disease itself of covid and sometimes even limited resources we have all managed to help the society to the best of our ability and just when we were thinking that this is all over we are faced with the third phase of covid our branch did our branch at ima margaon did extremely well and managed to even get the best president's award which we shared with the bardes branch but it wouldn't have been possible all by myself but it was with the complete help and cooperation and support of all the team members sometimes i think we bring out our best in the worst and in these trying times we have had all the members of ima come together and help each other at all times so my sincere thanks to each and every one of you who are over here and to all the ima members this year too we shall try our best to have as many academic sessions as possible awareness talks and camps and most of all some of the fun filled activities for the ima members i think priyanka is smiling so she agrees with me <clears throat> our women wing uh, which is headed by dr samita prabhu desai she did extremely well and i think the the jerusalem dance that was put up by i am mad gaon was i think the talk of entire goa for a while and of course they also beg the second prize at uh, state level uh, uh, conference of uh, which was conducted by the kurchore branch in the dance performance that they had put up we are also keen this year to start to set the ball rolling for the talks on i am mad gaon house which has been a long pending issue and with the help of our seniors i think i'm sure we'll be able to get somewhere and the process will start shortly lastly i request today being the martyrs day 30th of january i request all our members that we stick to ethical practice and fair practice as the doctors have been at the gun point of all that goes wrong with the patients today so with these few words i once again say thanks to all of you and again thanks to dr rufino and dr amol for being over here and for sparing their time i will now announce the team for margaon ima 
2022. President Dr. Babita Angle Prabhudesai. Pintu, are you there? President is Dr. Babita Angli Prabhudesai. I'm a practicing pathologist in Madgaon. Vice President is Dr. Preeti Araujo. Secretary is Dr. Priyanka Kamadakankar. <clears throat> Joint Secretary, Dr. Sai Spurti Naik. Treasurer, Dr. Yogesh Shetye. This is Joint Treasurer, Dr. Rahul Prabhudesai. Treasurer is Dr. Yogesh Shetye. Joint Treasurer is Dr. Rahul Prabhudesai. Central Council representative is Dr. Praveen Bhatt. State Council representatives are Dr. Samuel Aravatagi and Dr. Rajesh Sabirani. Advisory committee members are Dr. Edward DiMello. Sorry, State Council is also Dr. Shashank. Uh, advisory Committee is Dr. Edward DiMello. Dr. Brennan and Dr. Harshad Kamal. Our Women Wing represented, uh, Women Wing President continues to be the President of the last year, that is Samita Prabhudesai. Dr. Rufino, I request you to say a few words on this occasion and then I will go on to, uh, to introduction of the speaker today. Thank you, Dr. Bhakta. I am very happy to see the Margao branch of our IMA being very well and of course being led by that the team is the leader inspires the team and the team is as good as all the members together you have proved it to be a inspiring captain and we hope that in this year too Margao IMA will do a lot more than they did last year Margao IMA has done wonderful work both in the times of the pandemic, in educative sessions for the doctors, as well as recreative sessions for the doctors. And of course, heads off to the women's wing, our WDW. They have done well. And obviously, your team even this year, not only the WDW, but even your main team, consists of all males except of all females sorry except the treasurer you have kept the treasury in the hands of the male otherwise the entire functioning is with you able females and it's nice to see the empowerment of women in IMA going on the great work that the women are doing at the IMA level both at the IMA branches and at the WDW wing and as we said even on the day of the national day of the girl child a strong woman is the foundation of every family every society and a strong woman leads us all into greater performance greater heights so all the best to you babita priyanka and team and we hope we all together do human service for humanity as well as do good work for our doctors, 
stand by our doctors and do more educative sessions for our doctors besides the public thank you very much for today's session where we have vikram is such an inspiration to especially all young doctors of the state that we go well abroad and into lots of modern medicine it is a honor and privilege to have a way of go medical college our very own through going cars doing so well and thank you babita for organizing this cme state level cme and we know we'll have lots more to come from you knowing what you are and what you always want to achieve thank you very much thank you dr rufino for your kind words and for motivating all of us and i too uh, wish the state i may all the best and hope you achieve better heights during your tenure thank you dr amol and dr rufino without much ado i will now introduce our speaker dr vikram dalawlikar um in fact i have been associated with dr vikram the lawlikar uh, last year because we did a lot of videos together on the same topic and uh, the topic for the for today is menopause transition and hrt the current evidence i think dr vikram the lawlikar is the uh, he is a son of the soil he is a product of goa medical college he has done his mbbs and md from goa medical college and later on he has done his phd from uh, uni uh, from uh, university uh, college of london and he is uh, he is mrcog he is uh, in fact he gave me a good news some time back that now he has been Uh, promoted uh, as the associate honorary associate professor at university college of london so congratulations for that dr vikram and we are very proud of you he has he has uh, been working because he is a certified uh, you know, and qualified person in the menopause care and a trainer in the menopause care he has been running menopause clinics and i think today Uh, we couldn't have had a better resource person than dr vikram to talk about uh, uh, menopause and hrt which is also very dear to his heart and his uh, practice um, i think if i continue introducing dr vikram there won't uh, i think the whole cme would the whole time would be engaged in that so i will not talk about his academic heights but i think we will straight on go on to the topic and on to you dr vikram welcome we welcome you wholeheartedly and thanks for being over here today thank you thank you so much babita for that introduction uh, and thank you um, in your role as the president uh, as well as dr montero amol priyanka and i think there are other names which i recognize from goa medical college uh, who have all now reached quite a senior position uh, in working in the state of goa Uh, so thank you all for considering the topic today first of all it's not a topic that's commonly thought about but secondly thank you for inviting uh, for me to share my views a bit of what i know about the topic uh, so thanks to you all and hopefully i can provide you with some useful information about the topic today uh, just before i start and share my slides couple of thanks one is to my wife uh, because unless she was looking after my little one right now i wouldn't be able to do this uh, conversation with you so thanks to anuradha and of course thanks to my father um, i think he was very keen to join the cme today so he is probably has joined online uh, but all i have done in my clinical life or my academic career is all because of him so this particular webinar is for you uh, papa if you are joining today um so i'll share my slides and then we'll hopefully spend the next 40 45 minutes uh talking about menopause what is new what is new about hrt uh, and then i'll have lots of questions hopefully at the end so you can ask me all your questions uh, and we'll take it from there uh can you see my screen being shared right now yes we can yeah thank you so i'm going to talk about menopausal transition uh, and the hrt and what is the current evidence uh, for that Uh, I work at University College London Hospital. I do a menopause clinic there. I also do a lot of menopause research for the university. 
uh, there are some declarations of conflicts of interest which I have to do before I proceed. The first is that the contents of the slides are all mine. Uh, I have lectured uh, on webinars for Gideon Richter and Beatrice in UK, and I work both in the uh, national health service as well as the private sector. Why are we talking about this particular subject today? Uh, that's because it's mainly for healthcare professionals. Uh, what we say that 50% of your patients, if you care for men and women, they're likely to be going to be female. So half the population um, that you will see will be female patients. Almost one third of those are likely to be between the age of 40 to 60, and almost another third are rapidly catching up. So you will be seeing women going through menopausal transition at various stages uh, during the transition. We know that globally today, there are almost close to 700 million women who are around the age of perimenopause, menopause between 45 to 60. 70 to 80% of them uh, are symptomatic. And women now spend a third of their life in menopausal phase. So the topic is really important because if you take an average lifespan of 70 or 75 or even 80, then you know that 30 to 35 years of that lifetime will be spent in the menopausal phase. And this is also the phase when there are other health problems which can happen side by side besides the drop in hormones. So really it's not a minority issue. Most of us will need to look after these women for a long period of time in future. What are the stages during journey towards menopause? Um, so we know that premenopause is before any hormonal changes start, when the woman starts producing less hormones. Uh, and that's generally the first phase of transition is called perimenopause. So perimenopause is when the hormonal fluctuations will start. And this phase can last usually for two to five years, sometimes longer for up to eight or 10 years. But for most women, two to five years, between the age of 45 to 50. Menopause is diagnosed when the periods stop. So if someone has stopped their periods, you wait for a year, look at their last menstrual period. And then, of course, you say that it's a retrospective diagnosis that menopause has happened. And you have the postmenopausal phase. This is one year or beyond after the periods have stopped. For women who have surgical menopause, this doesn't apply because they will go through menopause in a sudden fashion when the ovaries are removed and they will be postmenopausal straight away as soon as the ovaries are out of the body and there is no more estrogen being produced. When does menopause happen? So for most women in the Western world, we say that the menopause usually happens around 50 to 51 about 10% of women will have it between say 40 to 45, and that's early menopause. In one in 100, will have it below the age of 40. That's premature menopause. And if you look at women under the age of 30, it can still happen. That's extremely premature menopause. In one in 10,000 or 0.1% of women uh, will have it under the age of 20 or under the age of 30, respectively. So the commonest figure is, of course, most women will achieve their menopause between 45 to 55. That's the range that we quote. Now, in Indian context, that's even more important. Because if you look at Asian women, Southeast Asian women, the average age of menopause in India is 46.2 years. So that's almost five years less than the Western counterparts. And that is even more important because there'll be plenty of women at 45, 46 who are devoid of hormones and have 30, 40 years ahead of them where they will have to plan to live a healthy life and try and avoid the long-term health problems. There's a definite rural urban division uh, and therefore you often find that women from lower socioeconomic uh, strata or those who have less education, those from uh, poor backgrounds often tend to have an even earlier menopause. Uh, the exact factors that drive this is not known, whether it's the nutritional status, whether this is awareness uh, and the stress that's uh, associated with information about periods, we don't know that for sure. But we know that there is a distinction that does exist between rural urban 
and higher and lower socioeconomic status. So what derives the timing of menopause? Why does it happen at a certain point for a woman? So the most likely explanation is genetic. Uh, we know that more or less daughters tend to follow when their mothers go through menopause, naturally. And of course, environmental factors which are determining this is smoking or chemo radiation. So smoking does increase your risk of having early menopause. Any sort of chemotherapy, radiation, or strong immune modifying medications because of some of the diagnosis such as cancer or immune uh, pathologies can often will result in earlier menopause. So why does the menopause happen naturally? Um, and it's all down to the number of eggs and the hormone production that happens from the ovary. We know that every woman is born with a set number of eggs. And as she will progress through second, third, fourth decade of her life, the number of eggs or follicles will keep coming down. Eventually, the follicles will finish and the hormones production will stop and menopause will happen. <clears throat> In fact, that process of the follicles de declining or depleting will begin very early, right from embryonic life. So even when it's inside the uterus, the fetus at 20 weeks will have about six to seven million ovarian eggs or follicles. But by the time birth happens, it's about one to two million. And by the time the woman starts her periods, there are about 300,000 to 400,000 follicles less. Dr. Vikram, I'll just interrupt you. Your uh, presentation is not proceeding. Just check, please. Oh, for me, it's going on. So let me... Slides are not moving. Yeah, yeah. Now, now they are moving. Yeah. Now they are so moving. I'll keep it, I'll keep it in the, in the uh, not in the slideshow view. I'll keep it short then. Thanks. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah. No, not at all. Um, can you see the picture of the ovary now? Next one. Yes, we can. Okay. So as we said, so the number of follicles or eggs in the ovary keeps declining over time. And that is one reason why you will often find that uh, as 40s and 50s approach, the number of eggs are going to be so low that there'll be no more hormone coming from the ovary. And from the 20 weeks inside the uterus, fetal life, until you get to around 50, the number of eggs or follicles will keep coming down so low that it reaches around 25,000, 20,000, and less than 1,000. This is when menopause will kick in. There will be no more hormones from the ovary. That's a very well presented study, which is, which is quite an old study in terms of 1992. But that's a classical graph that shows you how the number of follicles or eggs keeps coming down as the woman advances in age. And you can see around the age of 35, 40, there's a sharp decline in the number of eggs or follicles remaining in the ovary. So by the time you get to 50, the number is less than 1,000. And that often means there'll be no more ovarian follicle activity and estrogen production. Symptoms. So what are the symptoms of menopause? Um, about 75 to 80 percent of all women will experience menopausal symptoms. They may be mild, they may be moderate, they may be severe, but most women will experience some or other symptoms. There'll be very few women who, are, who will be lucky enough not to experience any symptoms at all. What are those symptoms that we talk about? So diagnosing menopause has changed now. It used to be a diagnosis based on blood tests, looking at FSH level, looking at estrogen level. That's no longer recommended. If you have a woman who is around the age of 45 or above and is showing signs of menopause, lack of estrogen, you don't necessarily need to do any blood tests for this woman to offer her either non-HRT or HRT uh, interventions for her menopausal symptoms or improving her quality of life. So it's a clinical diagnosis. It's not a blood test diagnosis. Blood tests are not routinely recommended as per the NICE guidelines. What are the symptoms? The most common 70% of women will have hot flushes or night sweats. So these are typical sensation of heat around the neck, heat on the rest of the body. Uh, the face becomes red, flushed, and there's plenty of profuse sweating. At night, such sweating can uh, soak into the bed sheets and it's very difficult to get sleep. So the night sweats can often then result in lack of good quality sleep. 
you have psychological symptoms which are often underreported sleep problems low mood increased anxiety palpitations irritability uh, very low energy low levels of libido lack of sexual interest these are all the psychological mood related issues then you have physical problems you have joint pains you have bone aches headaches palpitations dry skin uh, there's a particular symptom called formication which means that you have sort of end scrolling under the skin sensation uh, you have brain fogging difficulty concentrating and multitasking vaginal or local symptoms include dryness burning itching painful sex and of course periods the periods can be all over the place in the early stages usually there's a cycle shortening frequent periods in the perimenopause then that follows long gaps between periods and there'll be no periods at the end of that so a lot of irregularity of bleeding is typical in the perimenopause so do you always need tests to confirm you have menopause answer is no is testing mandatory to start some form of treatment whether it's non hormonal or hormonal the answer is no and is testing always required to monitor or change hrt the answer is no because the hormones fluctuate so much on a day to day basis based on your hydration based on when the last medication dose was it, there are lots of factors which get into the assay for measuring hormones so they're not reliable in most women women who have premature menopause below the age of 40 or those who have surgical menopause because the ovaries are removed either because of endometriosis or ovarian tumors or just at the time of a hysterectomy this very important thing to discuss before removing ovaries or surgical menopause and that's because symptoms will be much more severe for these women when they go through surgical menopause impact on their health is much bigger than if they go through a natural menopause there are plenty of complications the loss of bone density the problem with thinking cognitive issue they are at a higher risk of heart attack there are fertility issues to talk about and hrt hormone replacement for these women who have early or surgical menopause is really crucial for a good quality life and long term health. unlike what is popularly thought there is no risk of breast cancer for these women if they take hrt until the risk until they reach the age of 50 and so often there is a, 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 an uncalled fear about breast cancer for women with poi or surgical menopause no they are not at risk because they are simply replacing the hormone that's missing in their body that is different from a woman who goes through natural menopause after the age of 50 who needs to have hormones replaced then there are certain risks which we discuss about but certainly not for these women and of course they have to be in a specialist clinic or looked after by a specialist doctor because they will need to monitor their bone density they should have checks regularly to make sure that their lipid levels their diabetic screening remains normal at least until they get to the age of natural menopause which is 50 and if you're doing a hysterectomy or removing ovaries for a woman it's really important there is a plan before that operation to address the symptoms that woman will go through after she has her surgery as well as what the long term plan for her bones brain heart health in future if a woman has symptoms and they tend to be severe how do you manage symptoms there are plenty of options here it's lifestyle modification changes if she's working in the workplace changes nutritional or self help interventions there are some alternative therapies which are often talked about herbal acupuncture acupressure etc you have non hrt medications often described as antidepressants or gabapentin and of course you have the hormone replacement therapy now if i talk through all this it probably be hours and hours of talking so i'm going to only concentrate on the last bit which is the hormone replacement and of course we can touch the others when we come to the questions later on what is hrt so lots is talk about hrt what is it it is basically replacing estrogen progesterone and testosterone at the moment testosterone use remains off license in most countries but can be used along with estrogen progesterone and you can give it either local or systemic 
most effective treatment for menopausal symptoms as compared to any other treatment such as antidepressants or herbal remedies. This is probably the gold standard treatment for menopausal symptoms. And the decision whether a woman takes HRT, what should be the dose of the hormones? What should be the duration? How long do you use it for the woman? Should be really individualized once you discuss with the patient what her symptoms are, how long would she like to use it? What kind of hormones would benefit her? There are plenty of different types of HRT. That includes oral tablets, patches, gels. You have pessaries, you have sprays, you have creams. So the options are really lots in modern HRT. The, the hormones we use now are all natural. So again, I'm not going to dwell into technical bits of the hormones, but just to let you know, you have 17 beta estradiol, which is a natural plant-based estrogen, which is very safe and effective. You have natural progesterone or ditrogesterone, which are the two mild natural progesterones, which are used in modern HRT. This is different from the traditional HRT, which had synthetic progesterone, like norethisterone or MPA or levonorgestrel. We no longer use them as far as possible, because the, the modern natural plant-based hormones are much safer. And of course, you can have HRT in the form of tablets or in the form of patches or gels, and they both have their own advantages and disadvantages. This slide basically shows you why the natural progesterone and ditrogesterone are better, because they have anti-androgenic actions, uh, unlike the ones which are the old progesterones, which have lots of androgenic side effects. Uh, so we prefer the modern, newer, milder forms of progesterone. Patches or gels, the transdermal ones are especially useful, especially because if a woman is taking liver enzyme inducing drugs, she's taking some form of antibiotic, she's taking some form of uh, enzyme inducing anti-epileptics, has got liver problems or bowel problems, in these situations, really, transdermal patches gels are very safe. Similarly, women who have migraines or lactosensitivity, they do very well if you give them gels, sprays, or patches. And of course, there'll be a group of women who will only need vaginal estrogen. So women may just have issues with dryness of vagina, uh, irritation in the vagina. They may have they may start picking up infections such as urinary tract infections or frequent candida. They may have issues with intercourse. For those, just low-dose vaginal estrogen is perfectly safe and effective. You don't need to monitor or you don't need any other form of progesterone to be given with this estrogen. You can use it as long as you want, as long as the woman has symptoms. There's no risk of blood clotting or breast cancer with vaginal estrogen. It's very safe to use. Contraindications and caution. Where do you not give HRT? Of course, if someone has suspected breast cancer or they have had breast cancer in the past or they're having some kind of abnormal bleeding which has not yet been diagnosed or they have blood clotting issues right now which haven't been treated yet, in those women you will avoid giving HRT. In those women, even once they've completed their treatments, they could still consider HRT after their treatments are complete. Vaginal estrogens, as I said, is very effective for vaginal dryness. Painful sex can be used as long as required and have little or no absorption in the body. This is really very important for young patients who go through premature menopause. And there are some new treatments which are on the horizon. Uh, these will take some time to become available, but you've now got a DHEA pessary, which is a vaginal pessary that contains DHEA hormone which is very effective as it gets converted into estrogen androgen in the vagina. And you've got ospamifine, which is a selective estrogen receptor modulator. It can be given as oral tablet once daily, very effective for vaginal dryness. If a woman doesn't want to insert pessaries vaginally, she can use oral ospamifine as a very good option. This is basically a hormone replacement therapy guide for clinicians. I'm not going to go into the details of this. Uh, this is something we put together when we teach GPs or when we teach young doctors who are wanting to use HRT. 
and it's basically a flow chart that tells you what HRT may be useful uh, when a woman has just gone through menopause less than a year, more than a year, or whether it's surgical or medical. Uh, we can come to this in the question session if you have any, uh, but for the time being, I'm going to skip this one. So HRT can be commenced for the vasomotor symptoms, for other symptoms. And is there a limit? Should you be using HRT only for a specific time or do you use it long term? So the current recommendation is you can use HRT as long as the woman is happy. You have to review the woman once every year. Make sure that she does not have any medical contraindications or any other new diagnosis that may be risky. But for most women, they can use HRT as long as they have benefits for their symptoms and their benefits outweigh the small risk. So the concept that you use it for five years or 10 years is no longer valid. You can use it long term and you can use it up to 60 or even beyond depending on your conversation with the woman. For women who have premature menopause below the age of 40, they must take it until they get to the age of 50. That's replacing what they are missing naturally. And after 50, they will be like anybody else going through a natural menopause. So you again ask them, do you want to continue? Or if you'd like to come off, you can come off at that point. Long-term HRT, as I said in my previous slide, every year we see the patients, we go through their medical history. We make sure that they have no new medical contraindication. We advise them on their diet, lifestyle, BMI, smoking, and then make sure that medically the benefits of their HRT outweigh the risk. And there are women who now continue HRT into their 70s and 80s, as long as we are sure that their benefits outweigh the risk. Coming off HRT, you can stop HRT suddenly or you can gradually come off HRT by reducing the dose of hormones when the woman wants to come off. In my own experience, it's much better to gradually come off it so that the woman gets time to adjust to the drop in hormones. And it takes about six months for that process to happen when the woman can come off. That's just about symptoms, but what are the other benefits of hormones? Why are we so much emphasizing on HRT for long-term for the 30, 40 years of life after 50? Because HRT reduces risk of spine and hip fractures. It reduces loss of bone density. It positively influences the heart risk. So there's less risk of heart disease for women who use HRT for 10 years after menopause. It cuts down their risk of heart attacks. For women with premature menopause, it's a must to reduce risk of heart disease. And then of course, there's now recent evidence that use of estrogen benefits cognition and may cut down the risk of dementia. This is new evidence, needs much more robust studies. We don't have randomized trials and gold standard evidence right now, but watch the space. And soon we should be completing studies in relation to cognition dementia, which are likely to show that HRT reduces the risk of dementia. Why are we so much bothered about this? Because osteoporosis is silent. Women who have gone through menopause or especially early premature menopause or surgical menopause, the worry here is that these women can often suffer silently. There are hundreds and thousands of fractures that happen, fracture of the hip, fracture of the wrist, fracture of the spine. And these happen not knowing that the woman may have underlying osteopenia or osteoporosis. It's a lot of cost for the healthcare system and for the woman, it can be fatal depending on what sort of fracture and what age it happens. And we know menopause is a driving factor. It's the lack of estrogen at menopause, which will drop down the bone density and cause osteoporosis. You can see the healthy bone on the left side and what happens to it with osteoporosis. You lose a lot of bone trabeculase there. Again, fractures of spine is likely to then cause deformities such as kyphosis. And if you look at the graph, this is a graph that compares males versus females. If you look at the bone growth, the bone growth will be peak around say 20, 30 years of life. And from that point on, for the males, there is a gradual decline in bone density with age. But for women, look what happens between around 50 to 60. Once the menopause has happened, there's a sharp drop in the bone density. 
So if there's any other risk factor here, maybe lack of mobility or some other medication or this family history, then significant risk of osteoporosis and fractures will remain. So that's why the importance of doing something for your bone health. Menopause and heart, as I spoke, estrogen is heart friendly, keeps your cholesterol low, prevents any buildup of plaques in the blood vessels. And we now know that if a woman has HRT below the age of 60 years, it reduces risk of coronary heart disease. Uh, at least for 10 years following menopause, there's a reduction in atherosclerosis and heart disease. What if you take it beyond the age of 60? Then again, there's no impact on any risk of heart disease. You can safely initiate and take HRT even after the age of 60. Dementia. It's a global epidemic. And again, we are thinking a lot about breast cancer. We're thinking about infectious diseases. We're thinking about other mor morbidities. But there's a silent killer here, which is dementia, with millions of people being affected worldwide and the financial costs going out of control. Many of us will have no risk factors yet go on to develop dementia as we age. Can you do something? Yes, HRT could be a possible intervention. There are now studies which show that if you start HRT, estrogen therapy, early in your life, in the perimenopause, it preserves the hippocampal brain tissue. And so that volume preservation means you will have that much longer before any abnormal proteins accumulate, which increase your risk of dementia. And finally, immunity. So estrogen boosts immunity. We, we, we published a paper earlier in the pandemic and we looked at all the evidence for estrogen and its effect on immune system. And one of the reasons, besides few others, why women have had less severe disease and less deaths from COVID as compared to men is, is estrogen. It certainly seems to provide benefit for different aspects of immunity, whether it's B lymphocytes, T lymphocytes, innate immunity, cytokines, everything responds to estrogen. And it does look like estrogen has a protective effect against number of viruses, parasites, and bacteria. So that's all the good thing. That's all good thing about HRT. What are the problems? What can be the side effects, the minor side effects and risks associated with HRT? So the common side effects, if someone starts HRT, of course, is breakthrough bleeding. You often find that women get worried because they're thinking their periods are coming back or they're having this abnormal bleeding. There's nothing to worry in the first six months. It's just the body recognizes that you're having your uh, hormones back. So breakthrough bleeding is common in six months. And all you have to check is the balance of estrogen progesterone in the HRT and often sorts itself out. If you look at the other common side effects could be a bit of breast pain, bloating, nausea, or headaches. And these are similar to the ones that happen on the pill. So many women who've used pill in the past, such as a contraceptive pill, may have had one of these symptoms and they will go away once the woman keeps using it for more than three to four months. Some women may be very sensitive to progesterone, the progestogen type in the HRT. And I won't go into the details of this because again, this is a bit more technical, but you can always reduce the amount of progesterone that's in the HRT and try different forms of HRT so that you can prevent any changes such as the mood changes or any premenstrual symptoms that the woman has by avoiding a lot of progesterone in the HRT. Testosterone. Um, this is again important because it's often thought as a male hormone. Uh, it's not thought as a female hormone, but actually women produce three times more testosterone than estrogen on a daily basis in the fertile years. So you're much likely to notice the drop in testosterone that happens when menopause happens. So for all women, testosterone is really vital for bone, for brain, for metabolic functions, for urogenital health, for muscle mass, and the general sense of well-being. And it's crucial for sexual health, for libido or sex drive. And so, especially for young women or women who have surgical menopause, when you suddenly cut off the hormones or at a young age they lose their hormones, the impact can be devastating. So it's really important to consider testosterone 
along with estrogen progesterone as part of HRT. There are plenty of options. You have gels, creams, implants of testosterone available, and the blood test that we often use to make sure that the levels are fine, something called free androgen index. It's basically a combination of uh, the testosterone and SHBG in the blood. Risks of testosterone amount of use is such a tiny amount. You won't find any major risk. There have been lots of randomized trials which don't show any increased risk of cardiovascular disease or breast cancer. Minor side effect can be hair growth at the site of application of the gel. But other than that hair growth or a bit of oily skin at the local application, you shouldn't notice any major risks at all. So that brings me to the final bits, which is what are the risks of HRT? Why is HRT thought about negatively? And the problem is twofold. One is the problem that happened when some of the earlier studies of HRT were published. And second is we have not kept ourselves up to date with the studies and evidence that exists now. So as part of training, menopause doesn't get the importance that it deserves in the medical curriculum whether it's the undergraduate MBBS curriculum or whether it's the residency, postgraduate teaching in the ops and gynae. Menopause may be just a chapter, maybe one big essay question, that's it. Who cares? But that has to change and it is changing gradually. Menopause needs to be taught much more to both primary care physicians and specialists because a lot has changed in the world of HRT and menopause. So if you look at it, 1950s, 60s, 80s, it was very popular. HRT was the thing to do. But around 2002, 2003, there were two big studies which were published. And one was the WHI study. The WHI study is the Women's Health Initiative study, which was done in the US. And the other one was the Million Women study, which was done in the UK. These were huge studies, very good quality studies. And when they published their results, they said HRT causes breast cancer, stroke, and heart attacks. So there were lots of press publications, lots of headlines, which were all negative about HRT. And that caused the worry about breast cancer and blood clotting and the stroke. Vikram, I'll interrupt you over here again. Uh, yes, there's something wrong with the presentation. I think somebody has pinned it by mistake. So oh, the gosh. screen has become small and I don't know who has done it. Um, That's it. Yeah. Don't worry. If we can't find out who has done the pin, pinning bit, then I can continue and maybe we can catch up with the slides at the end. As long as you can hear me, I think we're fine. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. That's fine. Um, and so what happened is around 2002, 2003, as I said, there's always going to be a, uh, there was going to be a problem because uh, all these studies showed that there would be a higher risk with HRT, but um, HRT usage declined. Uh, and then automatically as the HRT usage declined, the antidepressant use went up. So these were women who were taking HRT were suddenly left without taking any HRT. And you could see the consequence as the HRT use declined, the graph shows that the antidepressant use really took off. So now what is the evidence in 2015, we released the NICE guidelines. And these are guidelines which say that HRT is not a danger to women. And we dismissed the worries which were associated because we reanalyzed the results of all the initial studies in 2002, 2003, and found that those risks had been exaggerated. The risks are really smaller than the ones which were thought before. I wish you could see my slides because there are a few figures I wanted to show you. But remember that the risk of breast cancer. See them now. We can see them now. Thank you. So these were the two graphs. Look at what happened with the HRT uh, use declined in 2002, 2003. And then you look at what happens once the HRT declines, there's a huge increase in use of antidepressants. In 2015, of course, we have now re-looked at the results and we say that HRT is not such a big problem. So what are the conclusions on HRT breast cancer? So if you take estrogen alone, it has no change in risk of breast cancer. If you're taking estrogen progesterone, slight increase in risk of breast cancer. And the risk is related to how much treatment you have. 
So if I put it in figures, if you look at the figure on the left hand side, so these are women up to the age of 50 who are taking HRT. Three out of 50 women will get breast cancer. This is the ones without taking HRT. So they're just about not taking any hormones and about three women will get breast cancer in five or 10 years. If you compare that figure to women who take HRT, and that's again for five or 10 years, four women will get breast cancer. So that's extra one person out of the 50 women who are taking HRT for five or 10 years. So it's a tiny, tiny increase in risk, something to the order of five or six in thousand women who are taking HRT. And if you compare that to many other things we do in day-to-day -day life, and that gives you a perspective on what is the actual risk. So if you look at the top line, that's the women who are not taking any medications, any hormones. So about 23 women out of 1,000 will get a breast cancer. If you look at HRT, you'll get the four extra women out of 1,000 who get a breast cancer. If you look at estrogen only, which is often the case for women who have hysterectomy, less women will get a breast cancer. So this is really significant. If you take estrogen alone, you see a less number getting the breast cancer. If you look at the pill, which is so commonly used in gynecology, the oral contraceptive pill or norethisterone is used so commonly to stop bleeding. It's the same risk as the hormone replacement. So why make a difference between the two? We often prescribe the hormones for stopping bleeding, for postponing bleeding, for contraception. Look at it, it's the same risk as HRT. Five extra cases if you drink two or more units of alcohol, three extra if you're a smoker, and look at the weight. If you're overweight or obese, look at the huge increase in numbers there. This is by far completely outweighing the use of HRT. So we often see women who have put on weight, who don't have healthy lifestyle, who eat uh, processed foods. Uh, we don't worry about that, but we worry about HRT which can improve the quality of life. So just to give you a perspective, an exercise always helpful. Look at the number of cases that drop with regular exercise, two and a half hours a week. So again, just to put into perspective, HRT, if it gives you quality of life, if you have risk for bone, brain, heart, and if it can prolong your healthy life, the benefits far outweigh that small theoretical increase in risk of breast cancer. Look at the VTE risk. That's the risk of blood clotting or stroke. If you use the right form of HRT, which is the transdermal patch or gel, there is no increase in risk of blood clotting. So this is a very good study, which had lots and lots of women from BMJ. And anything on the right side of the figure is risk of blood clotting. You can see that with oral tablet preparations. If you look at the transdermal, it's cutting the line in towards the left side, which, is, which means that there is no extra risk of blood clotting if you use hormones in the form of a patch or a gel. So again, risk doubles with older forms of HRT. There's no increased risk with transdermal HRT. That's in the form of a patch or a gel. Heart disease, if you start below the age of 60 or 10 years, there's benefit for heart disease and the risks are not increased even if you start in women after the age of 60 or below the age of 60. So if your blood pressure is well controlled, if your diabetes is well controlled, you can still take HRT very safely. So finally, menopause should be viewed as an opportunity to make changes in lifestyle. So if you see a woman in your practice, may it be primary care, may it be gynecology or otherwise, and just make sure that you give advice because your advice can change the next 30 years for the woman, uh, making sure that you advise on healthy diet, exercise, regular screening for chronic disease, mammograms or bone health, work-life balance, stress relief, mindfulness, yoga, all these will go into making the lifestyle healthy. It's, it's a good time to advise women about their future health. But also consider if the woman is suffering, she's severely suffering from symptoms, there are plenty of hormonal interventions you can do to make her life better. 
as doctors, what can you do? Healthcare professionals. Uh, I just included this slide because I often get asked about what can you do? Well, you can join the local menopause society. I think there is an Indian menopause society, which does lots of good work in the field of menopause. You can consider having a hormone expert in your practice or your hospital or your area of practice. You can upskill, update yourself and your team on menopause because there's so much plenty of material out there online on the British Medical Society, the Menopause Society, you've got the American Menopause Society, now the Indian Menopause or the International Menopause Society. Plenty of papers, plenty of toolkits for healthcare professionals to read and, and to use in your own practice. But it's most important are the last two. Offer your patients information on how they can support themselves during this challenging time, which is menopause. And refer to a specialist. If you especially see somebody with surgical menopause or premature menopause, they need a lot of input to make their future long-term health better. So refer them if possible at the earliest opportunity available. So final key messages, since publication of the original WHI Million Women study around 2003, a lot has changed. HRT has become much safer. For women under 60, benefits far outweigh any risk. Every woman's experience is unique. And so individualize your recommendation to women is really important. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Vikram, for, for this wonderful uh, presentation and for uh, uh, telling us about menopause and the, the, the treatment options that you have today, you know, to, to sort of handle the issues which are concerned with, with menopause. I think in today's times, it becomes very important that we become more aware of our uh, problems post-menopause and how to tackle them because most of the women today are professionals and they are working and our functionality becomes very, very important to us. And I think to maintain the, uh, a, a good uh, functionality, good uh, bony health, good um, uh, heart, I think all of this should go down a long way. Thanks again for sparing your time and uh, your uh, expertise in this, uh, in this with us. And now I hand over to Dr. Priyanka, who will uh, take the questions and answers, uh, and uh, you know you, you could answer them. Thank you so much, Dr. Priyanka. Thank you, Babika. Thanks, Babika. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much, Dr. Priyanka, for this lightning talk. But I would uh, request our delegates to kindly put on the questions and the question presentation. You can directly ask if you have any questions. Uh, directly uh, unmute. Yes, a lot of Hi, Brennan. Hi, nice to see you too. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Yeah. Uh, now, it was a very entertaining to mention the differences between the actions of transdermal and the oral estrogen. Now, in India, we do not have uh, transdermal preparations available. And considering that oral preparations are actually a problem for women more than uh, 10 years after menopause, as far as the cardiac risk is concerned, uh, would you recommend a certain therapy for Indian women uh, solely for the prevention of cardiovascular disease or uh, still prefer the uh, principle of uh, use the short shortest possible regimen for symptomatic treatment? Thank you, Brian, and thank you for the question. Um, it's, it's, it's a good question because the availability of HRT can limit what you can use. Um, for women above 60, uh, only for the purpose of improving heart disease, HRT is not a first-line intervention. It is to be used if the woman has menopausal issues, any symptoms, whether it's local, systemic, and then you want to give her the indirect benefit of improving the heart side of things. For women above 60, again, oral HRT does increase their risk of blood clotting. It doubles the risk. Uh, again, it's a thing that you discuss with the patient. So we still have patients in their 60s and 70s who have menopausal symptoms, who so are trying to improve their heart health. 
and they accept. They accept that they will try to reduce all other risk factors of blood clotting. So they continue on oral medication. A, a low dose of oral estrogen, one milligram would be fine. But if you have excess, for example, I know in maybe in cities in Bombay or other parts of India, you're now starting to get the gels and the patches, although it's still very preliminary. I think that will be the preferred route to offer once you get access to the transdermal preparation. Thank you. Uh, I have one more question, if Franka permits. Uh, with, uh, with our patients, we can interact you first. Uh, they are very potent to take combined, even combined estrogen and progesterone, and they prefer hormones compared to combined estrogen and progesterone. Uh, have you noticed on long-term use of tibolone and endometrial hyperplasia in case of endometrial TA associated with tibolone? So, so Brennan, so the first part of your question got cut. So you were saying they are on the combined estrogen progesterone. Yeah. Uh, in India, in tech uterus, yes. they, they get very different uh, estrogen containing pills. Whether it is a compound or anyway, you cannot give them uh, another pills. Uh, they even don't uh, take funds because they come with frequent regular bleeding for their endometrial sampling. So they prefer okay. to take pills. Uh, now, on long term tubolone, have you noticed any endometrial hyperplasia or endometrial? No. So, so if they are on Tibolone, it's very good because they are getting continuous estrogen, progesterone-like action, and the lining of the uterus should be thin. So the risk of hyperplasia on Tibolone is very, very low. Um, so one would really not even investigate them unless they had persistent bleeding, which is an abnormal pattern beyond six months or more. So Tibolone is very safe to use. The only downside of Tibolone, of course, is one, it is oral, so for women above 60, it may not be ideal. And the second one is often on Tibolone, the risk of breast cancer, the small risk which we talk about is there as compared to say other forms which are natural uh, hormones like natural progesterone or estrogen. But Tibolone is very good. The risk of hyperplasia is extremely low. We haven't come across hyperplasia purely on Tibolone uh, more than maybe once in a few years as compared to the estrogen, progesterone, the other common one HRTs that we use, they may be at a slightly higher risk, especially the ones which are cyclical HRT. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Vikram, I have a question for you. Why is it in India that we have a kind of a, a negative approach to, to HRT and why these transdermal patches and other forms of uh, preparations of HRT, they are not available. Is it because the pharma, the doctors do not prescribe them enough so that the pharma do not make it available? What is it? It's a difficult one for me to answer, but I'll, I'll still say there are a few reasons there. Uh, so the first reason, of course, is HRT traditionally hasn't been popular. Um, I think most of my colleagues who are, who are here today and, and my seniors, including Brennan, will agree, HRT menopause wasn't really right on the top of the agenda when we learned about gynecology or, or a few things. But with, with time, it has caught up. It, just like we were discussing the other day, in the Western world, it took 20, 30 years, and people are just now trying to realize that maybe there was merit in starting HRT for women who are very symptomatic and has other health benefits. The same change should happen in India now. So far, I think the healthcare professionals were not keen to prescribe because of the risk. And of course, pharma often will depend on that. They will manufacture things which are more in use because otherwise it doesn't make business sense for them. But I think as things change now, more and more people, more and more doctors will start prescribing HRT over the next five or 10 or 15 years. Automatically, you will see more and more preparations appearing uh, in Goa or in India or, or generally available. So fingers crossed, hopefully IMA can start that change in Goa. Thanks, thanks Vikram, thanks for that, yeah. Any more questions for Dr. Vikram? Looks like I have put everyone to sleep. I think uh, the concept is very clear, Dr. Vikram. So there are no more questions. Okay, thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to get in touch with me either through Babita or I think if you you'll have my email, you can you can always get my UCL details on the Google. 
Um, so feel free to ask any specific questions or any queries which might come on later. I had lots to cover, so I've really tried to keep it uh, as, as sort of summary level as possible. Otherwise, you can keep talking a lot, but that still is quite a, a mouthful, I'm sure. Uh, so any questions, feel free to get yeah. in touch. Dr. Otherwise, Vikram, thank yeah. you. How, Dr. Vikram, how often uh, do you recommend a memogram or uh, a follow-up uh, on patients with HRT? It's, it's exactly the same that, that is the routine national screening program. So in most countries, I'm not specifically aware about the program that's followed in Goa or India right now, but generally for women after the age of 50, the recommendation is they, they have self-breast examination every week or two. Uh, and if everything is fine, uh, if self-breast examination doesn't pick up any pathology, then they can have mammograms every three to four years. And that frequency is determined based on benefit versus risk. So if you do two frequent screening, you're likely to pick up some false positive uh, artifacts on the x-ray and you get over intervention. If you leave it too late, then the whole purpose of screening becomes uh, futile. So three to four years, once every three to four years is an ideal frequency of mammograms. Now, if you had menopause because of some other reason, say you had cancer treatment, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, then your risk of breast cancer goes up because of those treatments, not because of HRT. In that situation, you will be offered annual mammograms after the age of 40 or 45. So that's a slightly specialist group. But for most women, every three to four years should be the same frequency on HRT. Because HRT doesn't cause breast cancer. It's an association of risk that we see. Thanks for that, Doc. Brennan, your mic is muted. Okay. Uh, that is a uh, um, menopausal HRT have beneficial effect on colorectal cancer on the or uh, no beneficial effect on colorectal cancers. Mm, you're right, Brendan. So HRT has been shown to reduce risk of colorectal cancer or the, the women who got diagnosed with colorectal cancer while taking HRT had better prognosis and better outcomes. Uh, so that may be an indirect benefit. We don't know what's the mechanism how bowel cancers may be lower on HRT or what benefit there is in terms of what histology type it is or what sort of staging there is. But generally, bowel cancers tend to be lower or better prognosis on HRT. Now, why I ask this is because we are seeing exponential rise in colorectal uh, cancers in Goa. So it could be a uh, use of uh, uh, menopausal HRT could be potential for uh, some uh, a coincidental benefit, not only for colorectal cancer, but could be a coincidental benefit. Yes, I mean, if they are on HRT, they could probably you could probably say it's one of the uh, coincidental or sort of side benefits of being on HRT. If they're menopausal, uh, then they might slightly reduce their risk of bowel cancers. Yeah. I think there are a lot of gynecs in the in the audience. So anybody would like to ask any other question, Dr. Vikram? Priyanka, are you there? Yes, yes. Now, I was just checking if there are any questions in the chat box, but uh, I have not seen any questions in the chat box. So I think uh, if there are no more questions, I would like to really thank our speaker for the evening, Dr. Vikram, for such an enlightening talk on a topic that is not usually spoken about, not really discussed. Thank you so much. And on this occasion, I would also like to announce uh, the IMA Margam has taken the initiative of uh, having educative videos to create awareness about menopause. Thanks to Dr. Vikram and Dr. Babita. These videos are on YouTube and they are in English as well as company. And the link will be sent to all the participants of today's meet. And it will also be available on YouTube to view the videos which will create a lot of awareness about the menopause and the problems faced and all the 
therapy is available. Thank you, Dr. Vikram, once again. I would like to thank uh, our state IMA president, Dr. Rupin, sir, Dr. Amol, our state IMA secretary, for being very supportive in organizing our CME today. I would like to thank Dr. Babita, our IMA Margaon president, uh, secretary, and all the Dr. Uh, Yogesh treasurer and all the other IMA Margaon members for making this online CME possible. Thank you all the delegates for attending the CME today. We had about 70, 74 participants on Google Meet and we had another 15 to 20 on YouTube. I'll get the exact number later. So thank you once again and thanks for technical person, Mr. Pintu, for organizing and arranging this CME without any glitches. So thank you one and all. Have a lovely evening. Thank you. Long live IME. Uh, thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Priyanka. Thanks, everyone. And have a lovely evening. And any of y'all who, after watching the videos, if y'all have any queries, any questions, please feel free to put up on the chat box in the YouTube and Dr. Vikram would be there to answer these queries. Thanks a lot to Dr. Vikram for being here with us. Thanks to all the delegates who have been over here. Thanks, one and all. Bye. Good night to you. And thanks to Mr. Pintu for doing this technical backup for us. Thanks a lot. Bye there, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye.